Well, kia ora, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Passing Torch. Today, I'm very honored to be joined by Mani Bruce Mitchell. So thank you very much, Mani, for being with us today. My pleasure. Um, so I'm just going to start off with the same question that I ask everyone that I interview, which is, uh, could you just give us a brief introduction in your own words of sort of who you are? I like the challenge of brief. So um, yeah, Manny Bruce Mitchell, I'm an intersex person, born in 1953. So grew up around the whole shame and secrecy, which was the way um, the issue was managed then and still largely is today. And really didn't do my big work until after my mum died. So I was 40 and she'd left some documents that gave me a little bit of an idea. Um, so I went back and, and put the story together that I was an sex person. Now, peace I must start. I, I've been queer identified since my teenage years, I guess. But, you know, this was a huge part of the jigsaw that was missing. So as part of that very intense therapeutic work, I owned the fact that I'm an intersex person and went on my own journey. That was interesting because I, I didn't know any other um, transgender people at that point. So I did it very much on my own, figuring it out myself and, and came to the conclusion that I'm not really a man and not really a woman but I have aspects of both of those inside me so so that people understand in 1953 when I was born the medical world was still using the old Victorian paradigm so under that children who might possibly be male were um given male identity so I, I I was the the last not the last person but in that era when babies were routinely assigned male rather than female and then that changed not long after it which just throws up in the air the sort of nonsense of binary gender so for the first year of my life I was considered a boy then I had a lap laparotomy which is literally a procedure where they Cut you, cut you open and a decision was made from that that really I was a girl and again nothing had happened other than I had a humongous scar on my body so as a 40 year old looking at that and looking at the kind of kid I was um, the era I grew up in I was called a tomboy though that wasn't entirely accurate I've always loved colour I've always loved dressing up so I went are we allowed to swear on this program? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, fuck it, you know. I'm I'm me and I'm going to be all of me and I refuse to jump into the binary boxes. So what we would now call a non-binary identity, but I didn't have those words then. So hmm. I'm um, a, a proud queer person who's been an activist all my life um yeah. this year i turned 70 so i'm getting used to wearing the mantle of elder and comfortable with it yeah oh. that's really cool um just just going back to uh your childhood i mean what was it like just just generally speaking yeah good question um my parents we lived in remote rural New Zealand, so a little valley very close to the Whanganui River. So many aspects of my childhood were idyllic. So growing up on a farm, we were free range kids, um, me and my brother particularly. Crazy things we did on the farm, but what I would call my life was in different fragments. So there was that, that idyllic, wonderful life on the farm. There was the stuff that went on medically. And again, it would happen, but no one would ever talk about it. Um, so that kind of sat over there. And then I became 
a victim of childhood sexual abuse and I now know you know through my work as a therapist sexual predators are really good at identifying at-risk kids and I was holding my own parents shame I guess about my body and I love my mum and dad and I would have never done anything to upset them so you know when they said don't show anybody and by that they meant my different body um, I didn't have my genital surgery until age eight um, you know this he was a school teacher exploited that so that was going on so the, the clinical term for this is dissociation. Um, so I my life was in fragmented bits that weren't well joined up. So some of it was fabulous and some of it was you know, awful. And even now as a therapist adult with all these years experience, I still struggle to understand the kind of people that do terrible things to kids. And I'm glad I struggle because I don't really want to ever be able to understand it because I can't. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Um, when did you, I think you sort of touched on this earlier, but but when did you first uh, sort of find out about about what, what the term intersex meant? Yeah, well, I had a conversation with my mum after my dad died, so I would have been late 20s. And, you know, I had these not clear memories of being in hospital and I was trying to make sense of them. So I asked her the question and the, the word that came out was when I was born was I was a hermaphrodite. My mum became incredibly upset and started screaming and ran out of the room. And my mum came from that um era and generation that never showed emotion so seeing her scream and so upset so she came back into the room and um it's interesting we kind of realized something big had happened and without words just decided to go no further but I was left with this word hermaphrodite which I'll be totally honest I didn't know what it meant and I certainly didn't um, associate it with myself or my own identity and it's only years later when I start doing that work so I've got this word hermaphrodite and then I went to see an extraordinary Dr Hetty Rodenberg and it was Hetty who introduced me to the word intersex and she did it she came in um, to the medical library and I still don't know whether she borrowed or stole this book. So she bought me a medical textbook and, and I would learn later that that's how we both found out because, you know, like most GPs, she'd had none of this in, in her training. And we're going back a few years. Um, and so, you know, we learned about intersex together through a highly pathologized medical textbook, which is not the greatest way to figure out who you are. Um, but yeah, that, that was my first connection with my reality. And then not long after that, um, through a mutual friend, I found out about the work that was going on in America with ISNA and the person at the time that was known to the world as Cheryl Chase so that's where it all starts to fit together and in 1996 I had the incredible privilege of attending the world's first ever um, in-person intersex retreat in California yeah. so I was the only non-American who was at that retreat and you know it was an experience that changed my life meeting other people like myself for the first time and I was I think I was 40 41 at that point yeah yeah it's interesting you talk about that that meeting because it seems to be a a somewhat I mean I've watched your uh, intersection the documentary and it seems to be a common um theme that was that was brought up at that conference that um you, you all you all it was a really novel experience meeting other totally. intersex people what yeah was there was like? this uh, there was this idea um 
you know, that the best way of managing this situation with shame and secrets, you know, we'll do the surgery, we'll make you into boy or girl, and then you go on with your life as normal. And I mean, what I realize now, we were all a group of people with appalling trauma stories, but also meeting other people because I considered myself to be some kind of a freak, I thought. You know, there weren't other people like me. And the truth is, you know, we're, we're not a massively huge population, but if you put us all together, um, it's several million people on planet Earth. That's a significant population of humans. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so after that, um, that meeting, you decided you, when you came back here, you decided you wanted to start a similar organization. Is that right? Yeah, well, I had had, um, so again, that fragmented life. I had been a, a local government bureaucrat. So I'd been in um, the regional council was involved in civil defence. So I had a framework for, um, I guess, getting shit done. But I also knew how politics worked. I knew how government worked. I had an extraordinary network through that time and at the point that I left local government I was manager of civil defense so I you know I, I knew people in, in government I knew lots of people and so I came back I'm also an educator that was my original training and I it was very clear to me when we have trauma stories we can't change the past as much as it would be nice if we could that that's not possible but I was very clear okay I can't change the past but I can be part of changing the future so that was um that's what I decided to do and that that was the way for me to carry my own story my own trauma my own pain and I learned how to do that through I did a number of trauma healing workshops that were run by a person called Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, she was a, <clears throat> she did most of her work in America, but she'd grown up in Switzerland during the war. So it was Elizabeth's idea and, and part of that work and that thinking was also this idea of authenticity. So going back, you know, when I was working out who I was, it was like, no one's going to tell me who who I am. I'm going to work that out myself and be that. So um, part of that process was as a woman, whatever that means, I'd always been very embarrassed about the facial hair that I had. So not long after that one Christmas, I thought, man, what would it be like if I let my hair grow? It was just sort of an experimental thing. And it was hugely powerful because it was like that was the one thing that the doctors hadn't cut off. That was the one visible thing of the fact that I'm you know, not fully male or fully female. So it became a very powerful thing and something that yeah has been integrated into my reality. Yeah, it's a kind of in your face thing. <laughs> I also have my dad's silly sense of humor, which has certainly helped with my survival. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's that's nice. Yeah, um, and and up until recently, you've been you've been working as a counselor. Is that right? Yep. Um, so, I, yeah. I've been a counselor for um over two decades, and would still be a counselor, except last year I had a stupid accident and fell down the ladder while climbing out of my loft bed and smashed my shoulder. And I've gone on to have all kinds of complications as a result of that. I also lost my office in town. So I am no longer working as a counsellor. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm sorry to hear that. But but what what um what what brought you to that that role? Doing being a counsellor? Yeah. So when I left um, the regional council, the, the main work I'd done in the last few years was I, I'd seen people go off to disasters and then come back completely different people. And it was like, what is going on here? I wasn't understanding that. And I 
found out about some training in Australia that was run by a fireman called Jeffrey Mitchell. And so I, with some other people here in New Zealand, set up something called Critical Incident Stress. And it was very much around emergency services, but it was my introduction into trauma. So when I finished being um, working for local government I still had to figure out how was I going to make a living I didn't want to carry on being a, a government bureaucrat so I made the decision to retrain as a therapist and I originally thought that I would do work around trauma so that was the training I had and then during that period of time I came out as an intersex person and not not long after that transgender mostly in those early days older transgender people came to see me and in those early days I was not a a transgender qualified therapist there weren't any people doing that work so with those early clients we learned how to do the work together I'm Mm. very very grateful to the people that I worked with in the early days yeah and, and did you find uh, being a counsellor rewarding or, or helpful to you? Um, it's an extraordinary privilege to be somebody's counsellor therapist, you know, walking beside someone while they make sense of their life. So I don't know that rewarding is the mm-hmm. right word. I, I think privilege is the word that I would use. But yes, it... it, it continue to grow and stretch me as a person and you know I think to be a good therapist you carry on doing your own work and that's the kind of training model that I had had so doing lots of self-reflection I also had a a really wonderful um, very insightful supervisor that I worked with regularly so yeah, it was that that's the paradox that, that continued to grow me as a person. Mm. Yeah. And I, I miss I miss doing the work. And yeah. hopefully if I can recover from this injury, you know, one day I might get back to it, but that's on the back burner at the moment. Yeah, that that's fair enough. Um you you mentioned there as well, um, at, at a point, uh, I can't remember exactly when you said, but you you came out as an open, uh, an openly out um, intersex person. Mm-hmm. Um, how did it feel for you to, you know, make that statement of truth to the world, if you like? You know, now it's hard to remember now, but when I first did it, it was um, both exciting but also utterly terrifying because the social message that I had had as a child and as an adult was that you couldn't talk about this, that you would be destroyed by doing it. So one of the things in, in my regional council job, I'd had lots of media training. So I thought, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it well and use all the knowledge and skills that I had from that time. So I came out on national television with a very, at the time, popular um news program called Paul Holmes so I went from zero to sort of national television and in those days everyone watched television so you know had massive reach across the country um do you know in those early years there was never any negative consequence to doing that I mean I had lots of people reach out to me um very supportive in the early years, it wasn't unusual to walk down a street and have people come up and talk to me. My media training well prepared me for that. So, you know, I'd gone into that space knowing fully what might happen. I was very comfortable with it. So, yeah. Um, And then for a number of years, I was the only person. But then relatively quickly, other people also came out and... But one of the things I think people don't realise when, when you come out, you can't put it back in the box. So, you know, some people had very negative experiences of maybe saying things and then later regretting that, you know, they'd been so out. And 
So it's one of the things I'm always really um, saying to people. N nobody has to be out in a public way. Be out to yourself. Be out to the people that you love, the friends. But, you know, th think carefully about where else you're out. And, of course, social media wasn't like it is now. So it's even more tender thought, I think, needs to go in um, around how much we share in those spaces, which these days particularly not so safe. So thank goodness when I was doing this work, um, you know, what we would call TERFs in the extreme right were not as active and as vocal as they are now. I think it's yeah. actually probably harder at the moment than when I first came out. Mm, yeah, there's definitely been a shift in that in that landscape, unfortunately. Yeah, um, it has. Some, some, something else I touched on a bit earlier and I want to come back to is um, that documentary that you were involved in making, um, Intersection. Um, mm -hmm. Very good, very good film. I watched it the other day. How, how did that film come to be made? So the first film that we m made was called Mani's Story and that was a story about... Um, my own trip to America when I was putting my story together. And, and so it was a New Zealand on air funded documentary and it came about very quickly. Um, <clears throat> by very quickly, I, the trip was already planned and then the person who ended up making the documentary heard about it and was interested and I said, absolutely no way, this is a personal story. You know, I'm not interested. But anyway, they talked me into that we could do it. So that was made the same year of the 9-11 jets going into the towers in New York. So we arrived in America around that madness, and that's a whole other story. But Marnie's story was just it was about me and my story and it was on New Zealand television but I've developed a very close working relationship with the producer of that documentary and he always wanted to make um, another documentary and intersection was the end result so every year or so we'd put in a, a pitch and I think John had done seven or eight of them before the funding came through for intersection and as you know we we had the, you know, able to travel around the world and, and make it as um, diverse and involve other countries, other voices. That, that was quite deliberate, on uh, certainly on my part. And of course, if it was done now, it wouldn't be such a tiny group of people who felt safe and comfortable to be out. It would be you know, we would probably be able to film hundreds of people, which is exciting and wonderful that the community has grown so rapidly. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, you were talking about all those different voices. I mean, you had some old friends in there and presumably some new ones that you made along the way as well. Um, yeah, was, that a, was that well, a really those nice... Old, those old friends were people that I met at that first retreat and you know, they, they, they became profoundly important cornerstones, and I mean, to eat each other, because if you can imagine, most of us were older, we'd lived these lives of incredible isolation, and then we had that extraordinary weekend together, and you go through something like that, and yeah, you become friends for life. Yeah, yeah. So that was a really uh, positive experience for you to get to see them yeah. again, and oh. yeah. Oh, and, and I've, um, through my activism work, had the privilege and opportunity to travel to America um, numerous times. So I haven't been to America since um, COVID, so that part's been quite hard. And then, of course, last year I had the accident. So I haven't seen in person any of those people for several years now. But, you know, we're, we're in touch. We thank God for Skype and things like that. Skype, Zoom, you know, we're still in touch. Of course, yeah, that's really cool. Um, 
what sort of what was the impact of that film? Because I think I read somewhere that like the United Nations and universities were using it as as it's education. So, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a new documentary just come out, just been released in America. Is it My Body or Everybody? So you know, this is going to be the current generation film, which is really lovely because Intersection is covered. Um, over a decade as kind of the the most viewed and and used documentary so I'm excited that um, there is a new documentary and we're just working at the moment with the American Embassy to organize a screening um, here in Aotearoa so and and again that's another wonderful example of the activism having continued on and there's a, a a new generation now doing the work yeah that's really positive. Um, you've also been involved in the uh, International Intersex Forum, I, is, I believe is the is what they're called. Um, could you explain to uh, us what that what that's all about? So the first one was held in Europe. It's before we made the film, so maybe 13, 14 years ago. Um, as you know, I ran a not-for-profit organization and one of my board members you know we, we'd been talking about that this gathering was going on and we as the trust had no money but this person said you should be there money so they said find out how much it would cost to go to Europe and I did the research and they wrote out a check there and then said you're going so it was that that first forum was relatively small I think there were about 30 of us from all around the world and it was um, organized and fu funded in the sense of funded supported by ILGA um, the, the gay and lesbian organization that's based in, in Europe so they organized and ran that first forum then there was one the following year that was in um, Copenhagen. And then there was a, another one that was in Malta. And then the last one that was held was in Amsterdam. And there should have been one in 2000. I mean, it all the organizing had been done it w would have been in Bangkok but because of COVID it got um, put on hold mm. and there hasn't been um, a, a gathering since then There's, there is talk of doing another one but of course the community has grown so much it's like what what, what would the equity look like to make sure that there was a a representation of all the organizations now I, I mean the numeric would be huge and how would you fund that like intersex work is still not that well funded so you know this is something <coughs> that still hasn't been resolved but there are conversations going on trying to work out how to do it I think what might end up happening is that there might be a series of regional gatherings and then delegates from the regional gatherings being selected to go to the um, the world forum. Yeah, so quite, yeah. It's quite an important time. There are various things going on in the world and it would be really good to get together and share, you know, what is working, what is not working, what is changing, what is not changing, you know, what is the best way to do this in, in a way that actually creates real change. So I think that next forum, it's overdue, overdue, but it's also incredibly important. And this works yeah. damn hard, like it's um, tough on the people who do it and those chances to opportunities to get together, be with each other, what we would call uffy each other um you know create safe spaces where we just kind of hold how hard this work is and, and then celebrate together the the successes and and talk about the struggle so i think yeah. covid really reinforced to me 
you can't beat face to face. Like staying in touch is great. But you know, in an ideal world, you and I'd be sitting on a couch, eyeballing each other, having a cup of tea, not not doing it like this. Yeah, absolutely. But such is life now, unfortunately. Um, uh, and we've got thing... really wonderful platforms like the one we're using today that, you know. Yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, a big thing that came out of that forum was the um, the Malta Declaration. Um, yeah. And then there was a there was a similar sort of uh, declaration, the Darlington Statement down in, in Australia, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, have have those uh, statements had, have you seen a lot of positive impact from them on like a governmental level? Absolutely. So, you know, here in <clears throat> Aotearoa, we've had the incredible commitment from our current Labour government. So last year um, in the budget, there, there was $2.5 million for um, Intersex Healthcare. It's narrowly focused, so it's just for youth, which in this country is um, newborns through to um, people in their early 20s. And it's four pieces of work. And it's just getting towards the end when when that work will actually go out for tender and and this is world changing it, it's never been done this way um anywhere before and i'm i'm very proud of what this government has done and the commitment that it's made with this funding to do something so new zealand little old New Zealand Aotearoa is leading the way in this. And yes, it's a combination of all those things. So alongside what you've also um, talked about, what we've done here for the last 10 years, we had the round tables that were funded and supported by the Human Rights Commission. So if you like that, we've just reached critical mass in this country. Yeah, that's really good. Um, but are there, are there, um, laws you'd like to see amended or put in place still that would that would better support intersex people here you know i'm i'm not a fan of legislative change and, and i'll explain why so um when when i was working as a counselor one of my very first jobs was working um in the family court justice system so i worked with families that were breaking apart and I got to see courts and laws they're a very crude and not very gentle way of dealing with um, difficulties with families when, when you have widespread social change of course when you have something like homosexual law reform that's what makes a change but what we're talking about here is parents struggling and then we've got the medical system and we've got people who are trained in a binary heteronormative system. So the people who are leading this work, you know, haven't been exposed to new thinkings around gender, around sexuality, around trauma, around lots of things. So we, we need something that's going to bring all that together in a really healthy, safe way um, that creates change that works. Because with children, you've got two critical um, groups involved. You've got the birth parents and, and whanau, and then you've got the clinicians. Now, intersex variations are on a continuum. So at one end it's pretty simple and often no surgery or medical um, interventions are needed but, but down here at this end clinically it can be really complicated and there are a number of variations where absolutely you need um, medical support the, there are several conditions where without support the person would die so whatever the model that's evolved sort of hold you know, that, that vastness of that space and support clinicians and, and families when, when it's a, a serious situation and medical interventions. I'm not talking about surgery. I'm just talking about really good quality medical care. 
but I think the key thing that needs the change is introducing our new thinking around gender, around gender identity, um, how that is established in a person and getting away from this notion that people have to be either a boy or a girl with this congruent physicality. Now that thinking goes right back to the 50s with the work of Dr. John Money. So there are a number of puzzle pieces that need to be addressed to go from the situation that we've had that's produced all these negative and bad results to the situation in the future. But there's a lot of people in this country working on what that might look like. And my sense is there's a lot of goodwill, including um, the clinicians who recognise changes needed um, and recognise that their toolbox is a little bit sparse in this area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people don't uh, realise is the prevalence of intersex. I mean, as you were saying earlier, it's not a, a huge population, but it is still a, a, a sizable one. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a commonly cited uh, statistic, I'm not sure has it been, uh, is it outdated or not, but I think it's around uh, 2% or, uh, yeah, around 2%. Yeah, 2.7. 2 and again, this is contested because it depends, you know, which variations you include. And as I said, it's on a continuum. So mm -hmm. down this end, not obvious and as I often say to people you know most of us don't go out and get our chromosomes and, and hormone levels tested so there will be people walking around who have variations of sex characteristics who have no idea so yeah the, the, the within the community I think the generally accepted figure is 2.7 percent yeah and that i mean that's not an insignificant um proportion um but do you well, think... as they said in the original documentary and it would have changed now that was the population of um what was it tikawiti which is a mid-sized provincial town that's a lot of people <laughs> yeah absolutely but i mean do you think the average kiwi's understanding of of what it of the term intersex has gotten better over I mean since you were born or it's got a little bit better I, I think the huge change potentially <clears throat> and I wasn't around and in, in, in involved because of my accident with any of the communications but you know we we have um, the term now in the New Zealand census document so every single New Zealand adult has at least been exposed to the word um, now there'll be lots of people that looked at it, didn't understand it, not interested, but, but I'm sure that has been the catalyst for um, people exploring and understanding what the word means. And there's so many more um, activists and, and people speaking out now. So yeah, absolutely. The understanding around this issue has grown. Yeah. And that's really positive. Um, I mean, you and you I are doing talk this interview, that, that's an example. Yeah, exactly. Um, you also talked earlier about um, you, you identify as non-binary and obviously when you were growing up, you didn't have those uh, terms, but, but now you do. Was it, was it, I know coming to, to terms with identity on that sort of scale is something that a lot of my peers struggle with, I struggle with. It's a very common um, thing. Is, did you, did you find that um, adopting that, coming to terms coming to that term did you find that to be a difficult process or um i wouldn't describe it as as difficult but i also didn't have the pressures that um, people have now so as i said to you it was a very organic intuitive process that really came out of that therapeutic work that i was doing around authenticity so that's what drove me the, the other thing i need to say is i'm an outlier in terms of the intersex community so the majority of people who are intersex who have variations of sex characteristics would identify themselves as um, female or male so within the binary framework yeah yeah and that's a really important 
point. And and many of those people would again go on to have um, heteronormative identities, sexualities. Hmm. Mm. Um, would would you have any advice for younger people now who are struggling with their identity on, on any sort of scale? You know, would you have any advice for them? The, the first is every single one of us is a precious, precious human and um, to know that you are precious and that you are loved. And yeah, these journeys are not always easy because of what we've just talked about with social media and <clears throat> the people that exist to um, take us down. So I would ignore those awful people. I would Afi and look after yourself and then seek out people like yourself because we all need families and we all need people who care about us that we can laugh and talk with so finding safe communities uh, I think is really important but that key thing that key message is yeah every single life on planet earth is precious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a really good message um you know, I and, think... and we're, we're tearing up the rule book, and particularly you and the younger generation. You know, we're, we've torn up the rule book and we're building new, beautiful chapters of complexity that are reclaiming um, humanness away from that horrific Victorian binary simplistic model. And when you explore and read and understand traditional societies all over the planet, not everyone, but most have much more nuanced, complex understandings of what it means to be a human in terms of gender identity, um, sexuality, sexual orientation. And we have so many different cultures that have just right here in Aotearoa, so we've got the whole pre-colonial understanding of takatakui, for example. We know that there were gay, what we would call transgender people in those communities. They would not have used those words, they did not use those words, but they were known and celebrated and just part of Māori culture before the arrival mm -hmm. of Europeans. Yeah, and I mean, and you were talking realities and identities all out across the Pacific as well. Absolutely. And you were talking about um, the younger generations are sort of tearing up the, the old system, which is really great. And I mean, I, I personally would say, I don't know, would you agree that I think amongst the younger generations, there's a better understanding of what intersex is. I mean, there's oh, banners totally. and flags. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, that's really the yet the internet is both a rat trap and a, a wonderful source of information. So, you know, when when we talked about it, my first information was that medical textbook stolen or borrowed from the library. Uh, that was how I got information. Um, you just have to know how to do google or one of the more modern search engines and you get an absolute ton of information so yeah it's, i i really really enjoy just three weekends ago i was at shift hui out at Porirua and yeah the the, the knowledge um yeah. and beauty in that room just was heartwarming absolutely um would you say you have a a career high from your from your activism um, I had the extraordinary privilege of two years ago being awarded a, a, a Queen's Service Medal. Now, when it was first introduced to me, I went, absolutely no way, you know, like that's a colonial artifact and I want nothing to do with it. But then I thought I had no idea who had put forward my name because I do know that that process... Um, is quite lengthy and also that um, to end up on the list like it actually gets approved in those days it was the Queen of England 
and I thought, hang on, there's an opportunity for us to visibilize my community, and it's an opportunity for me to acknowledge all the extraordinary people that, because when I started this work, I didn't have an intersex community to work with, so I was working with allies and, and extraordinary people, and I thought this is an opportunity to do that. So, and also, I grew up in rural, conservative New Zealand. I, the idea that I would be in government house, you know, being given a medal from the Queen of England for something that as I grew up as a child, I was told to be ashamed, ashamed of and never, ever talk about it. So I'm not, I'm not going, yay, I got a Queen's medal. I'm just saying this event happened that has really honoured our community. And so on my citation, I am an MX, and I would love to have been standing beside the Queen when she was reading through the list, and she got, oh, and who is this Marnie Bruce Mitchell, you know, an MX? So there would have been a conversation around it, and that, again, it appeals to my sense of humour and what the community and all the allies that have worked with us have have achieved. Um, mm. It was a milestone, and I hope that it will be passed many, many times in the future. But, it, yeah, a very symbolic event. Yeah. Um, if there was one thing that you could say to New Zealand on behalf of the intersex community on your community, would there be a message you'd want to share? I think I would really speak to the good side of this country. So, you know, we've been talking about that it was the Labour government um, that funded the intersex work, but it, but I have worked with national governments as well. So the original, when um, we took our first report to the UN and that came back and we started the round tables, that was during a time of the national government and that first money came from national. So I'd like to say, you know, it, it wasn't political. I, I think it was people recognising that something was wrong and something that needed to change. And, and I think this country, when it's wearing its best face, it, it can do that. And I'm thinking of homosexual law reform. I'm thinking about marriage equality. I'm thinking about the changes that have been made to the Birth, Death and Marriage Act. Uh, this country has got a long way to go to be perfect. Um, but we've done some things here that we can be proud of, and I just want to say thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and particularly we, we, at the moment with the stuff coming from TERFs, with the Posey Parkers, we, we, I think we have to stand up, like, not fall down the rabbit holes because people get hurt doing that, but I loved what happened um, here in Wellington. So, you know, she didn't come to Wellington, but people still had this extraordinary celebration and gathering of our community, our families, our allies, and, and stood in the square and, and celebrated um, trans and, and diverse gender identities in a really beautiful way. So, I think we, our communities are being challenged, but I, I would like our challenge to be, we're not going to be sucked down to their level, but we're going to have to find clever, creative, humorous, safe ways for thriving um, while the stuff is going on and not accepting it. That's the other thing. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um You've talked a little bit about how, um, you know, uh, uh, your journey has been has been difficult at some points. Um, what 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 uh, kept you going is not the right phrase, but, you know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I said to you, <clears throat> I've got my dad's silly sense of humor. So that's part of it. I've also, I, I think, got 
from I think both sides of my family. So my mum was Ireland, dad Scotland. M my dad was um, a soldier in World War Two. He was captured in Egypt in the very early months and taken not into a um, prison camp. He was taken into a Nazi labour camp and. I can only imagine his experiences because he never talked about them. But he came out of that five years of extraordinary deprivation and experiences that belong in wars with, with a very crude and simplistic notion of, of justice. My dad wasn't a political activist. Um, but I realise it was in the core of his being to do right by people. Um, not my mum. Mum was conservative and cared more about what people thought then. But my, it was my dad who, one of his foundational stones was, was around justice and, and doing right by people. He was a very kind person. And I think I've... I've got that inside me and it's certainly, as I've done my own work and sort of reflected on my own whakapapa and what my own genealogy is, I can see that. Mm. Yeah, cool. that's really, that's really awesome. Um, zooming out and speaking a little bit more generally, just in, in terms of the world, um, <laughs> there's a, there's a real myriad of pressing problems that are facing everyone and facing future generations, especially, I mean, there, there's too many to list, you know, climate change, housing crisis, everything. Um, yep. What would you... Well, and, and our um, completely and utterly fucked economic system, like we've all been, um, I think we will look back at this time on planet Earth with neoliberalism as, as, a new version of the dark ages. I, I really believe that. And we, we have to find a, a, a new model to address all those things that you're talking about. So um, climate change, the fact that there are so many marginalized people all across the planet. So one of my cornerstones is, is human rights. And you go through that declaration and the language is terrible. It's all and, but if you look at what the essence, you know, those simple things, like every single person on planet Earth should have a safe place to live. They should have, have adequate food to eat. They should have adic adequate access to medical care. And we're saying that, <clears throat> and it sounds sensible and making sense, and we know even in this country so many people <coughs> don't even have that. That's kind of basic foundational things. Hmm. So do you think that economic model is, is our biggest threat? Well, it's failing, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know what comes next. Um, we, we desperately need a, a new model and a new way of doing it. And one, one of the things I thought about in the early days of the COVID, you know, when everyone went home, and suddenly, for the first time in India, people could see the Himalayan mountains and, you know, pollution levels were starting to drop. I thought, there it is. You know, we've had our big wake-up call and we, <clears throat> we won't go back to doing. And I believe right now there are more people flying around planet Earth having holidays, burning jet fuel than before the epidemic. It's like we didn't learn anything. Yeah. You didn't yeah, change anything. So yeah, you were know, right. Yeah. There are huge life threatening issues that are facing planet Earth. And I'm very aware, given the age that I am, you know, I, I'm not going to probably live to see this, but it's absolutely in in my heart. I mean, I have nieces and nephews who will. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that is another thing that I see amongst our queer youth is, is there is an absolute core understanding our issues are not confined to who we are as a community. Like people really do see themselves connected to a much bigger um, picture.
Mm. And that's really good. Do you have do you have um, faith in our in those younger generations coming through to tackle these problems? I have absolute faith in young people in terms of what's going on. I have no faith in the people of my generation and the one behind me. Um, you know, and, and saying that that's not a universal, there are people out there trying to do the best, but I, I just don't think there is the commitment. Like right now, today, as you and I are doing this interview, there is a crude, barbaric bombing war going on in the Ukraine of the kind that my dad and thousands of other people thought would never, ever happen again. Like, how can this be happening in 2023? Yeah. It's insane to me and that we didn't have some mechanism for stopping that. Mm. yeah um that's, that's just a micron because i mean yeah. when we could go around and, and talk about hideous things going on all around the planet i'm just using it as an example mm. um what would you say to young people who are who are wanting to change the world would you have advice for them yeah just keep fierce and <clears throat> don't accept no like really 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 important get involved in elections elections matter i i know lots of people go you know don't like labor don't like what's going on well that's i understand that we could end up with an extreme right-wing government in this country if we walk away from the political process so we need to get involved in local politics um, be involved in and in change be involved in the change making process yeah absolutely but be involved in yeah. ways that feel okay and safe for you you know mm. yeah. yeah that's paramount um well, that, that's all the questions I have for you, but thank you very much for um, talking with me today on this. Thanks, Connor. I've, I've really um, enjoyed this. This has been a privilege. I was thinking today because we started, you know, me saying that I was in Parliament and I thought when I started doing this work, it, it, it was not completely by myself, but it, it was quite certainly in terms of my um, genderqueer identity you know when I first did it there were no other people that I knew here and I thought you know it's so different now like we do have communities we do have each other to support each other's back so um, yeah yeah so, it's so really nice cool to see to be doing this talk yeah absolutely yeah. and as I say it was lovely talking to you and um Namahi everyone out there, thank you for listening and um, yeah, tune into another episode. Kia ora.